We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. You guys are now our third service of the week. Do you know that? Yeah, this uh, past Wednesday, we launched our first Wednesday night service. We had 136 people join us on Wednesday night, which is pretty amazing. We freed up a few seats in here, which is uh, part of the goal. And, uh, and we're really glad that uh, we get to now uh, open up our doors to more people in our community. So we're really glad that you're here. Before I get into the message today, I wanted to tell you about something really awesome that's coming up six days from now. So this Saturday, we have our next Go Day. And one of our goals as a church is to really build into our DNA, the culture of our church, that we're a church that serves our community like really, really well. We want to serve our community so well that we're known for our love for our our neighborhood, our our North Anne Arundel County, our, our people. And so one of the ways we're going to do that, we've set a goal of 100 people joining us this Saturday morning for our Outreach Go Day, and that we impact 1,000 people, that we have 1,000 small touches of, of random acts of kindness, and we've got all sorts of things planned this Saturday morning. We're going to be like things like uh, at a grocery store handing out reusable uh, grocery bags. We're going to be places handing out cold water. We're going to be at Aldi handing out a quarter so people can get that cart for free, and yeah, things like that. We're going to uh, be washing cars. We do this thing called a dollar car wash. People pull into our parking lot thinking they have to pay a dollar to get their car washed. But what happens is we wash their car for free, and then as they're pulling out, we give them a dollar for letting us wash their car. How cool is that? Just little things to say, we love you because Jesus loves you. And we got all sorts of other things planned. And so when you leave today, when you go out in the lobby, we have our Go Day table set up. And you can sign up for a place for you and your family to serve together. Remember, we're looking for 100 people to serve this Saturday. Make sure if you are planning, uh, it, it's great. It's just your Saturday morning, and then we land back here together, and we have free lunch. We feed you pizza for lunch, and then you go on with your Saturday. It's a really great way to serve together as a family. So make sure you sign up for that, all right? Everyone grab your copy of God's Word. If you don't own one, uh, let us give you the one that you just found in front of you. Write your name in that. And go to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to finish up chapter 3 and get halfway through chapter 4 today, and next time we get together, we're going to wrap up the series with the end of chapter 4 next week. All right, have any of you guys ever been in a situation before where you uh, had to, for some reason, you had to stand out? You had to like, how many of you enjoy an, uh, standing out? How many of you like like to stand out? You don't mind being the, the person in the spotlight. How many of you prefer not to stand out? You don't want anyone? All right, you, let me ask, just joking. <laughs> uh, no. Um, see, most of us, we prefer not to stand out, right? We prefer to kind of hide back a little bit. And, uh, but Scripture tells us that as believers, especially verses we reread in this series, right, we're supposed to wear certain clothes, not, not physical clothing, but like things like kindness and patience and love and grace and, and tenderhearted and mercy. And these are things that believers we're supposed to put on, and these clothes are kind of like clothes you would have worn in the 80s. They're like bright neon colors that make you stand out in this world. And so if you don't like to stand out, the unfortunate news for you is as a believer, as a follower of Christ, God says, I want you to go out into this world and stand out. I want you to, to look different than the rest of the world. And so what we're going to see today are ways that we can intentionally stand out, how we can put ourselves in a place where people see something different about us. A little bit of a story, nine years ago, uh, my family, this, this summer, uh, this upcoming, uh, sorry, this next summer will be my family's 10th year at Arundel Christian Church. And so if you go about nine and a half years ago, 
uh, when we decided we were going to go into ministry and started looking for a job, we came to this church as, I came to this church as a youth pastor nine years ago. And uh, it, some of you don't know this, but before that job in ministry, I had never been in ministry before. And so when I was, I was 34 years old at the time, and I, I felt like God was calling us to transition from my marketing business into ministry, and, but I didn't have any seminary experience, I was not ordained, and I did not have all the experience. That, so when you go into a job hunting website, you know, they tell you, here's all the requirements to apply for the job, and seminary is almost always on there. Uh, or at least strongly preferred is the way most people say it. Uh, ordination is usually on there and three to five years plus experience. And so I'm looking at all these jobs and I'm thinking, I don't qualify for any of these. No one's going to even look at my resume. But because I was a, a marketing guy in my previous entrepreneurism, I was like, I bet I could make a resume that stands out so much, that has a bunch of cool things on it that they don't realize that there's nothing actually on it. <laughs> and then maybe, maybe they would give me an interview. And so I had to create this, like, instead of just a paper resume, I created like a video online resume. I'm like, maybe just my personality will be exciting enough. They're like, all right, uh, if you, I don't know if we noticed, but there's actually no experience on this guy's like resume. So I had to try to find a way to stand out just so someone would listen to me for a moment. And, uh, and, and in the same way, Paul's saying to believers in the church in Colossae, but also to the church today, I mean, this letter was meant to be read and then passed along to other churches, and here we are reading it, we're called to be strategic in our ability to stand out. We want to stand out in this world. And so that's what we're going to look at today, and we're going to look at it uh, uh, really in a few different ways that we see Paul tell us we can stand. Here's, here's the first if you have your notes with you this morning, write this down, or your first fill in the blank is, we're called to stand out through excellence. If you want to stand out in this world, isn't it unfortunate that in today's day, that if you're excellent, you stand out? Most people just want to get by. Most people put in the bare minimum. We, serve, we work in a culture where people really don't try all that hard. Unfortunately, I'll give you an example. One of my favorite fast food places in this area, I like the items on the menu. All right, don't judge me. I know fast food's not good for me, but listen, I, I have anybody else enjoy the menu items at Wendy's? Yeah, but here's the problem though. If you've ever been to any of the Wendy's around here, you can be the only car in the parking lot. You can be the only car in the drive-thru and it still takes 15 minutes to get through it. To the place where if I'm driving through and I'm like, you know, a frosty sounds really good right now, I have to ask myself, do I have 25 minutes? <laughs> it, it's really, it's sad because there's, it's just not being done with excellence. And so I just kind of have given up on them. But if I were to ask you to name a fast food place that's known for excellence, who would you say? Right away, right? You just say Chick-fil-A, you don't even think about it. If you live on the West Coast and I asked you, name a, the fast food place that's known for excellence, you would say? Yeah. In-N-Out Burger, right? You guys know this, and what do Chick-fil-A and In-N-Out Burger have in common? They're both, they're both owned by believers. They're owned by Christians. They actually put scripture, uh, In-N-Out Burger actually put scripture on the, on the bottom of everything. Everybody knows Chick-fil-A is owned by a Christian family. Like, how cool is it that there's people who say, you know what, if it's Christian, it ought to be better. We ought to be known for being excellent in our quality, in our service, in everything. We're going to be better than everyone else. And that's one of the ways we can stand out as believers. We can say, in the workplace, at home, in my neighborhood, I'm going to strive to be excellent. I want to stand out. Now, I have to digress for a moment because we got to talk about something. The passage of Scripture I'm going to start at today is going to put a huge elephant in the room, and I can't just read past it. So let's, the very first verse we're going to look at is verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 22, and it starts with this. It says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. And so I don't think it would be fair for me just to say, all right, well, let's just pretend that the Bible's not talking about slavery and, and not address that. Let's just pretend that and just talk about excellence in the workplace. I could do that, but I think it would be unfair. So let's pause for a moment and talk about 
why is Paul endorsing slavery in the New Testament? Aren't we as Christians, don't we now know that this is an evil thing that we should avoid? And why does Paul seem to address it like it's no big deal? Have you ever wondered that in the New Testament? Why is Paul just talking about slavery like it's no biggie, right? So let's, let's talk about that for a moment. In the Old Testament, especially within the Hebrew tradition, there was a version of slavery that's very different than the slavery that we think of when we think of slaves, right? It was very regulated by the law. It was really kind of more like a six-year employment contract. You would, you would, uh, someone would lend you money, and in exchange, you would agree that for the next six-year period, you were going to work for them, really be a slave to them, do whatever work they needed done until you're, either your debt was paid off or six years. And at the six-year mark, they had to release you, no matter if your debt was paid off or not. And every seven iterations of that, we had this thing called the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, not only did you release and free all of your slaves, you also uh, forgave everyone's debt. Nobody had any debt anymore. By the way, never lend any mon money on year 49, right? I mean, it's like, oh, that doesn't make sense. And so there was this regulated system it was, it was more like, uh, it wasn't like the slavery that we're talking about here in the New Testament, where you have Greeks and Romans. Uh, the slavery that we're talking about here that Paul seems to be endorsing is more like the slavery that you're actually picturing. There was cruelty. Uh, nobody got freed every six years. If you were a slave, you were a slave. And so the question comes back to, well, if that's the case, the, the Old Testament version of slavery, there is also another version where uh, a, a person could become a bond servant. So at the end of the six years, when a slave was supposed to be set free, they could decide, hey, I really love my master and their family. I really want to continue to serve them the way I have been. So I'm going to make myself a bond servant. And you look through the Old Testament, there was rules how you'd go to like a doorpost and you, you would pierce their ear through the doorpost. It was a symbolic thing, basically saying if they've got this, this piercing in their ear, that they've decided by their choice to be a slave to their master. That's why when Paul in, in the New Testament uses words like Paul, a bond servant of Christ, what he's really saying is I have decided by my free will to serve Jesus for the rest of my life. So that's like the Old Testament version. This New Testament with the Greek and Romans, the church in Colossae, Paul is talking to a very different version of slaves and masters. So the question again, why is he endorsing it? Why wouldn't Paul just abolish it? Why wouldn't he just stand up tall and say, slavery is evil, we should have nothing to do with it, and not mention uh, how slaves should behave to their man, all that. And here's why. Let me tell you why. In this day and age... Uh, historians say that about 40% of the people of this day were slaves. That's a, almost, a, you know, a, that's almost half. And slaves were as important in their system, their economy, according to the uh, historian uh, G.B. Caird. He says, ancient society was as economically dependent on slavery as modern society is on machinery. And so if, if the whole system were just to be abolished in a day, the entire economy would crash. This was not the way things were done back then. That doesn't make it right, right? You can't just say, hey, we really kind of need this system, so let's just do it. That doesn't make it right. Here, here's another problem, is that Paul and the Christians, they were a very small minority, not the majority. They didn't have any power. So if Paul had just said, listen, I don't have any power, we don't have that many of us, but let's just go ahead and just make a claim right now, uh, we're not going to do the slavery thing anymore. Slaves, you're free, per, per Paul, uh, you're, you're done. That would have gone really, really poorly for the Christians. It would have been a, a huge problem, and to even think about that, what, it would have taken what's supposed to be a true gospel message and turned it into a social gospel message. And so Paul realized, listen, the only way to get rid of something that we know now as Christians to be evil is to change it from the inside out. We've got to change people's hearts. In order to change people's hearts, it's going to take some intentional efforts of saying, hey, listen, slaves, those of you who are now followers of Christ, let me tell you how you can operate with your slave master so that we can change the system from inside. He's not endorsing it. He's helping to regulate it so that one day it can be gone. 
And here's how I know that Paul thinks slavery is, is bad. And that Christians have been at the forefront of this process of abolishing slavery since the very beginning. When you look at uh, who was majorly involved in the abolition of slavery, even in this country, you see Christians at the forefront of that. But let's talk about just Paul for just a moment. You hear verses like this from Paul in Galatians 3.28. He says, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, Paul recognizes that there's an identity that's more important than slave or free that happens when you give your life to Christ. The the very next section that we're going to look at next week in Colossians, you're going to meet an individual named Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave. He was actually a runaway slave. His slave master, slave owner was a guy named Philemon, which there's a whole book of the Bible called Philemon. If you read Philemon, you find out the relationship that Onesimus has with Philemon. That Onesimus was a runaway slave and that uh, what should have happened is you capture Onesimus, you take him back to Philemon, and then he gets punished or killed or imprisoned for running away. But what does Paul say to Philemon? He says, listen, Onesimus has given his life to Jesus. And when I'm sending him back to you, and when he gets back to you, I want you to receive him not as a runaway slave, don't punish him. He is now your brother in Christ. Receive him as such. See, Paul knows that slavery is evil. I'm not, again, I'm not talking about the regulated kind of employment version of slavery in the Old Testament. I'm talking about the version of slavery that each of us thinks about in the own history of our United States of America. It's evil. And thank God for people like John Wesley and William Wilberforce and, and, and uh, the Quakers who in our history, when you study it, Christians, had the process of bringing about abolition of slavery, Christians have been behind that movement from the very beginning. And there's still a lot of work to do in many parts of our world. So I say all that to say, what you're about to hear Paul say is not encouraging or endorsing slavery. He's simply working to change hearts from the inside out. If you want to change people's hearts in this system where 40% of the people are slave laborers, you've got to change it slowly and from within. All right. Now let's talk about how this relates to us. We're going to be talking about slaves Back in the day, right, the system was slaves and slave masters. Today, the, the system is a little different. It's employees and slave masters. No, sorry. <clears throat> it's employees and employers. And so the same principles are going to apply to how we can stand out in this world in our interaction in the workplace. And so we're going to look at that. Now, by the way, as we're talking about work today, what kind of mission field you have at the workplace. When you add up all the hours that you spend in work on average, you take out the lunch breaks and the, you know, the water breaks, and you take out the time that you're not there and the time you're home sleeping, you add up just the time you're working on average, the, the most people are going to work for 20 years of their life at work. That's an incredible amount of time. That's an incredible mission field. You're going to spend actually more time at work than doing anything else you spend awake doing. That's pretty incredible. And so when we're looking at how we can stand out and we look at these verses about slaves and slave masters, employers and employees, what can we do to increase our ability to stand out in this environment? So here's the first thing. I want you to write this down. You already did. Stand out through excellence. Let's let's talk about that. All right? How can we be excellent according to Paul? The first thing, the first uh, three C words I have for you, the first one is character. Write down the word character. If you want to be excellent in this world, you simply are going to be known as a man or woman of character. And a good definition for character is a person who does the right thing even when nobody's looking. Even when no one else is paying attention, you're known for doing the right thing. You're, You're known for... For pursuing righteousness. Let's look at this in Colossians 3, verse 22. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. And listen to this. It says, Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. You know how difficult that is? 
For us to want to do the right thing, even when no one's paying attention in the workplace, when, when no one's really going to even go back and review your work and see whether or not you did it right, it makes it much easier to just kind of not really try all that hard. To say, you know what, this is going to get by. It doesn't need, but no, Scripture says that if you're going to be excellent, you're going to have the character enough to do the job right, even when no one else is paying attention. One of my, my favorite hobbies I've told you guys about, I like to refinish uh, solid wood tables. It's a kind of a side hustle. I buy them really cheap on Facebook Marketplace, solid wood dining tables. I sand them down, and then I put stain on them. And then I, I put a coat of polyurethane, a couple coats of polyurethane. And then I put, I sand that to like with a 320 grit sandpaper. And then I put a third coat of polyurethane. And then I sand again. I put a fourth coat of polyurethane, a fifth coat. I keep adding coats of polyurethane until the table's done right. But do you know the difference between a table with three coats of polyurethane, which is not enough, and a table with five coats of polyurethane? To the naked eye, you're not going to notice a difference. A couple years from now, you'll notice a difference when the table's cracking or something's not working quite right when the polyurethane starts chipping because someone didn't put enough coats of polyurethane. So I could just take the table, put it back on Facebook Marketplace, and just kind of do just the bare minimum and tell people I did five, six coats, and they would have no idea. No one would know. I would, right? Jesus would. One day they'll figure it out that the table's really not as great as they thought it was going to be. And so we have opportunities, especially in this day where many of us in this room were working from home more than we ever have before. Uh, you, maybe your, your employer lets you work from home and no one's really paying attention to how you use your time. No one's watching and reviewing your work a lot of the time. How can you show your character by doing excellent work even when no one's paying attention? I want you to think about that. You know, for a lot of us, we think about work and we think of it as like a bad thing. You know that a lot, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that work is something that came as a punishment from the fall. If you go back to Genesis, you know, they ate from the tree they weren't supposed to, and then, uh, the, you know, then work came as a result. You know, that's not true. Adam, before the fall, was given a job to do. He was given work. God told him to tend the garden. God told him to name the animals. He gave him work. What happened because of the fall was work became difficult. It became more toilsome. It became less fun. One day when this whole experiment's done and God's like, all right, I'm done with this place. I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to build a new heaven and a new earth. And those of us believers are uh, we're, we're experiencing that new heaven and new earth. You know what he's going to give you? He's going to give you a job. It's going to be work to do. We're going to have to tend the new creation. It's going to be enjoyable work. But we live right now in a moment where for a lot of us, work is not enjoyable. We don't enjoy it. We don't want to do it. And so being a man and woman of character simply says, I'm going to do this job right, even when nobody's paying attention. Here's the second thing is, is the second C word is the word commitment. How can you be excellent? You're going to be men and women who have commitment, that you say you're going to do something and then you do it. And when you say you're going to do it, you not only do it, but you do it with incredible excellence. Let's look at this. In Colossians 3, verse 22, the second part, it says, serve them. This is your, your slave master, right? Serve your employer sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do. We should pause right there. That's like a whole sermon. It says, whatever you do, to work at it willingly. Decide in that moment, I want to do this. I'm opting to do this because my boss has asked me to do it. I now have an opportunity to stand out as excellence. I'm embracing this opportunity, this moment. And then it says on, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Do you see what happened right there? 
a mind switch that has to happen in all of our heads that whatever job you have, and I don't, if you're working in the workplace, then that's a you know, traditional type job. Maybe you have the hardest job in the world. Mom's where you at. You know what I'm talking about. And maybe you're working at home and maybe you are a student right now and your job is to excel in your studies and excel in your tests so that you can uh, learn and, and, and go do things that God wants you to do. Whatever your job is, God says, I want you to do it as if you were doing it for Jesus himself. Think how that would shift your mind. If you Think about this. If you bust tables as your job, do you think you would bust a table a little differently if you knew that the next person that was coming to sit at the table was Jesus? I mean, think about it. If you knew that Jesus was the next guest at the table, you'd probably be very intentional about making sure there was nothing sticky on that table, making sure that everything underneath the table was swept out, making sure the salt pepper shakers were full and they were right where they're supposed to be, making sure the menus were straight. You would want to do excellent work. Why? Because Jesus is going to come and experience it. It doesn't matter how like menial you think your job is or how important you think your job is, whether you're scrubbing toilets. Listen, if you're scrubbing toilets, clean that toilet as if Jesus is the next person who's going to use it. Clean that toilet as if Jesus has to eat off of it. Man, clean that thing with everything you got, even when your boss isn't paying attention. I remember that was the last one. A lot of us, we do something really, really well, and then we immediately go in and we're like, hey, everybody, come look at the amazing job I did. I want to, I, I need some recognition from you all. No, you don't need that. You didn't clean the toilet for them. You cleaned it for Jesus, and he notices. And that gets back to this proper motivation. It says in the next verse 24, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. Any, uh, any young people in here, you got chores at home? Where are my kids at? You got, you got a chore? What, what's your chore at home? Yeah. Sweeping. And the dishes. All right, well, think about it. Next time you're sweeping, uh, when you say sweeping, some people I, I found in, in the South, sometimes sweeping is, is also means vacuuming, but you mean sweeping, not vacuuming. Okay, so when you sweep, you're sweeping as if, like, Jesus is going to come and ex- 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 examine what you've done, right? You have the opportunity to do it with such high level of excellence that you're getting in the nooks and crannies, you're pulling out. You know, sometimes it's easy just to sweep around the chairs. I'm talking like pull the chairs out from underneath the table and then sweep properly and then put the chairs back. Do it right. Because when you pursue excellence like that, it's going to stand out and people are going to notice the difference. We get to pursue excellence through being men and women who have this level of commitment. Here's the the third C under how to be excellent is compassion. So what happens here is we now switch over to Colossians chapter 4. We change from how slaves are supposed to respond to their slave masters, and now we look at how slave masters should treat their slaves. And it says in Colossians 4 verse 1, masters must be fair or must be just and fair to their slaves. Remember that you have a master in heaven. And so if you're in this room and you're an employer, you get to be an excellent employer by being known for your compassion, by being known to be kind and fair and just in the way that you treat the people that work underneath you. And by the way, your boss sees you treating people with that level of compassion, and it shows excellent work. They're going to see a team that trusts each other and loves each other and and is intentional about building a strong team culture, and that's excellent work. And so these are three things we see right in here about slaves and their slave masters and slave masters and their slaves, where we can stand out in this world through, through excellence. Now, here's the second thing. If you want to stand out as a Christian in this world, you're not only going to try to pursue excellence, but you also are going to stand out through caring. Write that down. Stand out through caring. And here's what I simply mean by this. A lot of us in this world, we just try to get by by keeping our nose down and minding our own business. 
We don't even notice when the person next to us is having a terrible day, when someone across from us is crying, or there's uh, maybe a pattern that is, which should be noticeable to anybody who's paying attention. But for a lot of us, we're not paying any attention. We're only worried about ourselves and what's going on in our lives, and we don't care. And so simply put, what Paul's saying is, if you want to be excellent, if you want to stand out, you need to give a, you guys have no idea what word I'm about to use, huh? I'm going to choose the word, you need to give a hoot. You like that one? There were some other words, some edgy words. I'm like, ah, I'm just going to go with hoot. You need to give a hoot. You need to keep your eyes up, paying attention to what's happening in the world around you and in the lives of your family and your neighborhood, the lives of people that God has put you in their circle of influence. Pay attention to what's going on in their lives because doing so just simply says, hey, I care about you. I don't just care about me. I care about you. You're going to stand out in this world if you care about other people. Here's how Paul puts it. He says in chapter 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Maybe you're wondering, well, what does that have to do with caring? Well, think about it. What do you do according to this verse? What does Paul say you got to do before you pray? You got to do so, with, with one, number one, with an alert mind which means you're, you're paying attention to what's going on in the lives of the people around you. You're paying attention to what's going on in the world. You're paying attention to things because you care. It's like simply saying, hey, when I go to God in prayer, when I devote myself to prayer, I want to know how I'm praying. I want to know how I could be praying for you. I, I care enough about the people in my sphere of influence that I want to have my eyes open to how I can be praying for them. When somebody tells you they're praying for you, what are they simply saying? I, I care about you. I care about this test result. I care about this, this thing going on in your life. I care about your grandmother. I care about this. And the other part, too, is not just with an alert mind, but with a grateful heart. That's the other thing. When you go to God in prayer, hopefully you're going to God with your eyes so open to all the wonderful things that are going on in the lives of people around you, the wonderful things that are going on in your own life that you're able to simply care and say, God, thank you so much for the blessings that I'm experiencing in my life. You see, most people are clueless. They prefer to keep their head down and mind their own business. But if you want to stand out, Christian, you simply are going to care about other people. The world doesn't do that naturally. You're going to care about others. You see, when someone devotes themselves to prayer, what they're really saying is that they care about all the things they're praying about. And if you look at why this is so important, and if you keep reading in verses 3 and 4, Paul says, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. This is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. What Paul is simply saying is, hey, I want you to, when you're praying, I want you to, to care enough about all the people around me and all the people around you that don't know Jesus. I want you to care about their eternal salvation enough that we're praying that God will give us opportunities to share the gospel. You want to stand out in this world, you're going to be excellent and you're going to care about other people. All right, here's the, the, the third and final thing. If you want to stand out, you're going to stand out through kindness. You're going to stand out through kindness. Now, a couple of thoughts on this. Some of you might think, well, aren't care and kindness the same thing? They're not. Some of you have things you care about a lot. You care very intensely about them to the point where you're kind of a jerk about them when you talk about them to other people. Like you're so, you care so much about this political issue that when you go and you talk about it to anyone else, you, you don't come across as very kind, right? And so caring and kindness are two different things. They go together really well. You can care about someone and in caring about them then uh, reflect kindness in your response. You can be kind. All of us can be known for our kindness. Have you ever met someone before? That was so kind to you that they stuck with you all day, like the memory of that interaction. Like you went into a grocery store, the person checking out the groceries was just so kind. 
Like they said something, they were so polite, they were so whatever. And you're just like, my goodness, that was the nicest person I've ever met in my life. There's something about being ridiculously kind that sticks, that makes you stand out. If we were a church of people that showed ridiculous kindness, we could change this whole community. It says in verses five and six, it says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Do you see what's happening here? He's simply saying, hey, I want you to be really strategic in the way you interact with those who don't know Jesus. And in those interactions, I want you to be just ridiculously kind. I want you to be gracious in your conversation, right? I want you to be attractive in your conversation. I want the words that come out of your mouth and the way you respond in those situations to point people to the love of Jesus. Now, I love this idea of living wisely, this idea of living strategically. I want to ask you, are you a believer? Are you living strategically to open up these opportunities? I wrote down a few questions. How about this? What circles... Are you strategically putting you and your family in so you have an opportunity to show this kind of kindness to non-believers? That maybe a circle within your neighborhood, maybe a circle, uh, maybe your kids are part of a sports team and you're intentionally trying to get to know the other families there. So you have an opportunity to show this kind of almost impossible kindness. What coworkers or neighbors are you strategically befriending? Do you have people who, in your circles who don't know Jesus that you're going out of your way to make sure they see the love of Jesus in you because you're being friendly and kind to them as you befriend them? Are you living wisely in that regard? Here's a little trick we have in, in my house. And listen, um, you might think that some of these things are like, well, so you're just saying kind of like, hey, let's strategically trick people in a relationship with Jesus. Listen, if you think that there's like some quid pro quo here, I want to give you permission. If you're, uh, I, I, I only went into this so I could tell them about Jesus. If, if it, their eternal salvation is your strategy, is the, is the end result of your strategy, I'm saying you got permission to be strategic in how you interact with other people. And so one of the tricks we have in my home is uh, ask yourself, what friends of your children do you allow to sleep over at the house on Saturday nights? You might think, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, in our house, the rule is if our friends, if their friends come over on Saturday night, then they're going to church with us on Sunday morning. And guess what? They get to see not only in our own home our kindness, but then they get to see your kindness in the next day. They get to see the kindness of a body of believers that maybe they've never experienced before. We get to live wisely and strategically in that regard. Maybe ask yourself this, who do you invite to lunch at work? Who are you being intentional about pouring into uh, a relationship so that they can see the kindness of Jesus in your life? Remember, the Bible simply tells us if you wanna stand out, to be ridiculously kind. All right, every Sunday and now Wednesday night here at ACC, we end with a question that you are asking the Holy Spirit to guide you. And that question is simply, what now, God? God, what do you want us to do in light of this passage of Scripture? What changes do each of us need to make so that when we walk out of here today, we're not walking out of here the same way we came in? What a waste if every Sunday you walk out of here the same way you came in. And so be intentional about saying, God, what do you want me to do? Is there a change or a tweak or a relationship or something I need to get rid of, something I need to add to my life? What do I need to do? And I want you to flip over your note sheet and write that down in the spot that says, what now, God? I want you to get in the habit of, of putting pen to paper. Let me make you think about some of the things I said again. When you are excellent, people will notice. When you are caring, people will notice. When you are kind, you guys know the line now. People will notice. You will stand out. You'll be wearing those bright 
vibrant colors we're talking about throughout the book of Colossians. If you go out into this world and you pursue excellence even when no one's looking, you work as if you're working for Jesus, right? And you decide you're going to be uh, really, really caring about the issues and the people around you. And then you show them kindness, ridiculous kindness. You are going to stick out like a sore thumb, my friend. And you know what people are going to do then? They're going to wonder what it is that you have that they don't. And they're going to want it. I'll have what she's having. I want to encourage you to put on that new wardrobe. Colossians 3.17, whatever you just wrote down, whatever the Holy Spirit has asked you to do, here's what God says through Paul. He says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I want to encourage you, the thing you just wrote down, the step you're going to take this week, I want you to do it as a representative of Christ. When people see you doing excellent things, when they see you showing a care and compassion for others, when they see you, uh, your kindness, they're going to see Jesus in you. You're going to be a walking, talking you know, gospel message everywhere you go. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have as a family of faith to open up your word on Sunday mornings, to worship you corporately together, to learn more about who you are, who you've revealed yourself to be in your word. We recognize that Paul has pointed out some very clear ways that we can stand out in this world as ambassadors for you. Would you help us to be excellent in the work that we do? Would you help us to show a caring attitude, just to, to want to know what's going on in the lives of people around us so that we can care for them? And then would you help us to be kind even when it's difficult? Would you help us to be kind when no one else is? Would you help us to, to respond back with kindness when other people are not kind to us? And in doing so, Father, would you help us to represent you and your gospel that other people would come into a saving relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.